is that it is a mighty upsurge of democratic protest against the military dictatorship. But much to Foote's sadness, missing from the thousands in the square, was his left-wing hero, Nye Bevan. In an attempt to unite the Labour Party, Gateskill had made Bevan shadow foreign secretary. And at the Labour Party conference of 1957, Bevan had decided to reverse his previous position and attack the unilateralist resolution that Foote supported. That if you carry this resolution and if you don't run away from it, you'll send a British foreign secretary, whoever he was, naked into the conference chamber. What you are saying that the British Labour movement decides unilaterally that this country contracts out of all its commitments and obligations entered into with other countries and members of the Commonwealth without consultation at all? And you call that statesmanship? I call it an emotional spasm. Of course, I heard the whole speech up in the gallery. I was listening and it was a terrifying moment, one of the most terrifying moments in my political life. But I didn't question his sincerity, you know. He was still, he, when he was in a debate, he would be out to win. And he was out to win that debate as he'd been in other ones. Unfortunately, he was defeating us in, in, in that debate. Although Bevan's speech won plaudits from Gateskill, it led to a bitter rift with foot. He attacked Bevan in Tribune, where he was back as editor, having lost his seat at Plymouth. The two men were only reconciled shortly before Bevan's death in 1960. Bevan's South Wales constituency of Ebervale selected Foote to fight the by-election. The chain-smoking Foote stood as an uncompromising left-winger, pro-CND and anti-Hugh Gateskill. Now, how about the discipline in the Parliamentary Labour Party on the H-bomb? Would you defy the party whips to vote against the H-bomb? Well, we'll have to wait and see what we get when we get there. I don't think that they would have any right, the whips, to deny me the right to vote according to the pledges that I've given in this election. The new MP for Ebervale was soon to lose the whip for his left-wing rebelliousness. He embarked on writing an official biography of Bevan. But three years after the by-election came a terrible car crash. Foot had been driving up from Evervale with his wife. We went into a lorry and was smashed up. Michael nearly lost his life. I didn't know about that. They wouldn't show me the newspapers, but I'm told subsequently that they were all writing his obituary and his friends were writing his obituary with tears in their eyes. But uh, I recovered from it and it was, uh, as it turned out, very good things happened to me on account of the, of the car crash. One, I gave up smoking because I couldn't smoke anymore, and that was a very good thing to do. I should have done that long before. It took me some time to get used to it. Next, I started reading Montaigne in hospital. The aftermath of the crash demonstrated both his physical resilience and his remarkable ability to see the bright side of adversity. He was to spend three months in convalescence together with his wife, Jill. But when the Ebervale MP then went back to work at the Daily Herald newspaper, where he wrote a column. He was promptly sacked. It was a bit of a blow then, but there again it turns out very fortunate for me, but because of that, I got the job of a book critic on the Evening Standard, which, uh, which I had for 10 years. Best job I've ever had in my life in a kind of way, because you could pick the book you wanted to read and write and write about, and uh, I, I so, in a kind of way, Everything that happened at that accident turned out well for me. Foote's fellow Bevanite, Harold Wilson, became Labour Prime Minister in 1964. Foote had written a brief but adulatory biography of Wilson, but he spurned the chance of a ministerial job. In contrast to his old friend Barbara Castle, Foote preferred to remain on the outside as a consistent critic of the government and the not-so-still voice of Wilson's left-wing conscience. Governments must choose. That's what Barbara keeps telling us quite rightly. They must choose between an old orthodox deflationary policy and an up-to-date full employment socialist policy. That's what the government's got to choose about. And so far, so far, it's made the wrong choice. That was the first 
real period of breach between Michael and me because uh, I went into government because I believe, you see, I'm not, I'm, I'm not interested in, in uh, standing on the sidelines and jeering at the fellow or, or woman who's trying to do a job. I believe you should be in there. What we've got to do is to use this conference, readopt the socialist policies which can reinvigorate our movement and enable us to win that next election instead of submitting to the defeatism that is all around us at the present time. I say we can break out of it, but we will only break out of it if we have faith in our own principles, not in the principles of our enemies. Michael Foot, surely the uh, most effective uh, rostrum speaker in any of the parties. Pretty good speech, I think, don't you? <laughs> and like they thought, I think it was pretty good. And uh, quite right, too, and I'm in favour of people in the Labour Party making sure that we do stick on the lines. So, uh, I haven't anything to apologise for that one. After Labour's shock election defeat of 1970, the left-wing rebel and strong supporter of public transport decided it was time to come in from the cold. He won a seat in the shadow cabinet and sought to reconcile the party's divisions. When Labour returned to power in 1974, Foote was made employment secretary. He had the task of seeking to control wages and incomes, a policy he'd bitterly attacked only four years earlier, when it was run by the previous Labour employment secretary, his old comrade in arms. This time I went to see him with some... Oh, about the nurse's pay. Uh, and I went and he gave me a little lecture <laughs> about inflation <laughs> and how they've got to be wage restraint. You know, it was almost like hearing an echo of what one had said oneself in years gone by, but he had adopted it. And he didn't seem to find any um, anything odd about the fact that he should be completely reversing his role. The difference is my our, our wages and incomes policy was a much better one than hers. <laughs> and it worked, you see, and it worked very, very well, especially, I may say, for the nurses. The Scottish coal miners had helped bring down the Tory government. But now Foote's policy as employment secretary was based on Labour's social contract and his close relations with the unions. The deal was that the unions would cooperate with the government in exchange for measures they wanted, like the Health and Safety at Work Act and equal pay for women. I know you call yourself a feminist. Indeed. And, and, I, hope... <laughs> and I think you are a great feminist in theory. <laughs> but in fact, in practice, <laughs> I don't <laughs> think you are. All these charges now saying that I'm not a feminist is absolutely monstrous. I'm strongly in favour of women's rights. I, when I had the chance, we went ahead with equal pay and all these other things, maternity grants and people getting all these things, all done under your influence. It wasn't a lot of my... Yes, of course it was. Because that's another thing about you. You're a terrible flatterer. Yes. You, know, you, you flatter people. You yes. say things just purely for flattery. You don't believe a word that you're, Which you're word saying, you, you know. What about you? No, you're, not, you're, no. you're just saying it. Uh, but, uh, Flattering, you're not, you don't really believe I had any influence over that at all. No, some people deserve to be flattered, including with you at the head of the list. What's wrong with that? There's quite you, a lot wrong with it. Well, you want all women to be treated equal. Do you think that's a good way to treat them? And you would complain if I went and treated other women in the same way I treat you, wouldn't you? Well, Barbara you would, Castle, you for example. <laughs> Barbara's in a different category. Yeah, well, they are, you see, you're back on the defensive now. Yeah. I brought an apple. She let me hold her hand. When I brought bananas, we kissed beneath the band. When I brought an orange, she let me hold her tight. I'm going to bring a watermelon to my girl tonight. I think Michael did fall for women, and that's another foot thing. They're very, they fall for women quite easily. What do you mean? But, well, I think they do. I think they're very attracted by by women, and they and they um, they lose their hearts quite easily. 
I remember saying to Michael when I very first met him, if you ever have any extra needs, I don't want to know, and even more important, I don't want anyone else 